us have been following this series um, on relationships. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, what I want to say before we get into it real quick is I want to encourage you, if you have missed any of them, after this service, go home and listen to the entire series because there's nothing as dangerous as half information. Amen. So that you get the full picture because I don't want a few years down the line, someone to be like, oh, Pastor AK said this or PF said that without getting the full picture. Hallelujah. Now, today, this whole series has been just kind of different, amen? Uh, Anybody want to testify? It's just been a little bit different for me as well. And what we're going to do today is that for the first time, PF and I are going to be preaching together. Because, you know, when somebody posts a controversial story on Instagram or on Facebook, what's the first thing people say? I want to hear the other side. So today, we're not going to keep you waiting. We're just going to have you hear the other side right here, right now, amen? I'm going to start by doing just a very quick recap of what we talked about last week. Now, if you want to know the facts, if you want to understand, if you want to, you know, uh, really get a full picture of the purpose of a thing, the best thing that you do is to go back to the designer or to the manufacturer. Amen? How many of us are the kind of people who, when you buy a new toy or you buy a new car or you buy a new machine... You actually read through the manual. How many people? Okay. Less than 10%. Maybe about three or four hands. PF is one of them. My hands are like right behind my back. I never check the manual. So I always run into trouble and I'm like, babe, um, come help me. By which time I've kind of messed it up. And the truth is, just as most of us sitting down here had to admit that we do not read the manual, for a lot of us, we get into relationships or into marriage without checking out the, the manual. And how many of us know that marriage was God's idea? Marriage was God's idea. Hallelujah. So we, uh, we started last week by going to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, to figure out when God designed marriage, what was he thinking? What was the big idea? Amen. And we specifically focus on that place where the Bible says that, and God saw that it was not good that man was alone, and so God made him a help meet. And we said that that phrase, help meet, is actually a compound word. It's made of two words, the first one being ezer, and the second one being kenegdo. Now, ezer simply means help. That's how it's translated in the Bible. But if you go back to the root of that word, ezer actually means a savior. Ezer means deliverer. Ezer means protection. Now, if you look through the Bible, every time that that word Ezer is used, it's actually referring to God being our help. And so we, made the con- we came to the conclusion that when the Bible says, I will make for man an Ezer, God was saying, I will make for man a helper like me who will protect him, who will save him, who will be there for him in the time of battle. Amen? And so what I want us to look at this morning is the other part of the word Kenegdo. Kenegdo simply means a counterpart. So God is saying, I will make him an Ezer, but not just any old kind of help. I will make him a help that is suited, that is adapted, that is a counterpart for him. And we said that God was very intentional to use those words because counter means that that person would look like it's your opposite, but it's actually a part of you. And I said that that was why God made sure that he made Eve out of a part of Adam so that Adam, even though Eve looked ex- opposite from him, looked different from him, acted different from him, was different, came with different skill sets, but Eve was also a part of him. Amen? And so what I want to challenge us with this morning is if you as a man, whether you're single or married, could begin to look at your potential spouse if you're single or your current spouse, if you're married right now, if you could begin to see her as God's excerpt to you, God's hand in your life, God's help to you, who has been put in your life by God, specially adapted for you in such a way that he, she will be a savior to you, she will be a help to you, she will deliver you, she will protect you. For me, and, and there was one more word, strengthen. For me, the two favorite words there are to protect and to strengthen. So I want to challenge the men. Can you see, begin to see your wife as that in your life? Because if you do, it will completely change your marriage and it will eliminate any kind of abuse. I said last week that if you want to, if you you see people who abuse a thing, it's because they don't understand the function. Amen? 
You would not abuse a spouse if you understand that that spouse has been placed in your life to do the battle of life with you, to enable you, to strengthen you, to be a blessing to you directly from God. In the same manner as God is our Ezer, the Bible says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hill from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord God Almighty. The word there, help, is the same word, Ezer, praise the name of the Lord. And then I want to challenge the women, whether you're single or you're married, whether you're in person or you're online, to begin to see yourself as God's Ezer to your husband and begin to act accordingly. See, if I look at myself as God's Ezer to peers, there is a, going to be a difference in the way that I conduct my marriage. Yes. My actions, <laughs> he said yes, my actions, my demeanor, everything about the way that I comport myself, the way I see things, the way I act, the way I, I do things, will be in conjunction with protecting him, with saving him, with being a blessing to him, with strengthening him. I won't be his problem. Yes. Amen. I would not be his problem. Yes. I wouldn't be his stumbling block yes. because I understand that I've been placed in, my, in his life to help him. Yes. Amen. How come you weren't saying yes when I was talking about the men? Just curious. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So I want to give you one quick example and then we'll move right on. See, for instance, using Pierre for, as a, an eye as an example, one of his primary assignments, one of the primary assignments that God has given him is his vision for ministry as a pastor. So I want to be honest with you. There are things that I have had to do differently. There are things, adjustments that I have had to make in the way that I do things, in my personality. There are new skills that I have had to learn because I can't be my same old self if I am going to fit in with God's vision for his life. Amen? And I'm going to have PF talk a little bit more on that and I'll give you a few personal examples that may seem silly to you, but show you the fundamental reason why it is so important that in everything that we do, if we could conduct our marriages as though we are doing this thing together, you will see a change. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to, uh, uh, I, I like, you know, what my wife has said. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why we are preaching together is also to illustrate what goes on in marriage. It's a partnership. Yes. Yeah, we, we work together, we are a team. It is important that we do not forget that the woman, as important, as awesome, as helpful, as powerful as she is, in the way that she, uh, Pastor A.K. has described, was created for a very specific purpose, Amen. right? Eve was not made uh, uh, randomly. <laughs> There's nothing random about Eve's creation, Amen. It was deliberate. It was intentional. That's right. God had a plan in his mind when he made Eve. And like she said, it was for her to be a help meet for the man. Amen. 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 He created Eve specifically to help him achieve a God-given vision, a God-given mandate. Adam received the vision of Eve. Adam received the vision. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Amen. Adam did not invent the vision. Hallelujah. It was not his idea. He didn't wake up one morning and say, Do you know what? I am going to the garden of Eden. I am going to dress it. I am going to keep it. All right. God gave him the vision, amen? amen? And the thing about God is this. He never gives a vision without provision. Amen. So Eve, in all of her glory, in all of her black girl magic, yeah? <laughs> amen? All right. Was given as part of the provision to help Adam achieve the vision. Amen? Amen. Eve was given to Adam, not from his feet, hmm. because she's not under him. All right. And she was not given to him from his neck. To control him. To control him. All right. So when you hear that rubbish, a man is the head, a woman is the neck. <laughs> that is not of God. That's right. Amen. That's right. I tell Eve you was what. given to Adam from his side. Because the vision that God gave to Adam was too big for him to achieve by himself. 
In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, the vision was not given just for him, it was for them. Hallelujah. God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, have dominion, and subdue. Amen. But God did not speak those words to Eve, He spoke it to Adam. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 23, it says, The husband is the head. And there is no level of political correctness that can erase those words from Scripture. The husband is the head. As the head, now this is where we need to be careful. As the head, he is the leader. Amen? Amen. He is the leader. And the role of a leader is to lead a group of people to achieve what? A goal. To fulfill purpose. Amen. To carry out a mandate. Adam had a goal. Adam had purpose. Adam was going somewhere. I, 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 I want to just pause for a minute and say this. A lot of people, a lot of young ladies, and this is not to be critical, I just want to give you a tip. A lot of young ladies, when you are at that point where you, you need to make a decision about who you are going to spend the rest of your life with, I hear a lot of things that you're looking for. You want him to look a certain way. You want him to uh, behave a certain way. You want him to have certain things. The most important thing you should be looking for, does he have purpose? That's, that's right. Does he have a vision? Amen. I'm not talking about a plan. Because we say, oh, what's your five-year plan? Five-year plan to do what? <laughs> All right. What's your 10-year plan? What's your short-term plan, your mid-term plan, your long-term plan? That's not what I'm, I'm talking about, purpose. A plan is created to fulfill purpose. And if his only purpose in life is to amass wealth, then you have to ask yourself, mm. is that what God made you for? Right. To support him in amassing wealth. Yes, it is important that he is tall and dark and handsome. All right. <laughs> very critical, All right. amen? <laughs> it's, it's, it's very important check, that, check, you know, he, he, uh, he, he likes to enjoy life. But it is more important that he has purpose. Amen. So the question you should be asking him is not what is in your bank account. It is in what are you planning to do with your life? Mm. What is God's plan for your life? Mm. If there is no purpose, let mm. me tell you what happens. People just wander around in circles. Mm. And when we wander around in circles, mm. it's problematic. That's right. Adam had a vision. He had a purpose. He was going somewhere. Eve, now let me also say this. Eve was not brought into the picture. Eve did not enter the story to give Adam the vision, to dictate to Adam, this is the vision. Or to give Adam instructions to tell Adam what the vision is. So if you are trying to tell your husband this is your purpose in life, mm. it's problematic. You can encourage him, you can support him, but you don't dictate it. It is God. It is God that gives the vision, and her role is to help fulfill the vision. Amen. So my brothers who are married, and the ones who are planning to marry. What is your vision? What is your purpose? What is your vision for the family? You cannot be a leader if you do not have a vision. And let me tell you this. People who do not have visions end up as followers. Hmm. Hmm. People who do not have visions end up as followers. And imagine how that would be in a marriage. You don't have a vision and you're trying to lead somebody, where are you leading them to? Mm. And what betide you if you marry a type A personality woman? Does somebody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the Bible is very specific. The husband is the head. And when that structure is distorted, either because of, uh, of a lack of vision, or a lack of understanding, that unit is in danger of missing out on achieving the purpose that God has assigned to it. 
So, so God gives Adam the vision and then brings Eve to his side to help him achieve the vision. The primary role of a leader is vision. If you do not have a vision, you are not the leader. Mm. And you as the husband, as the head of the house, you must have a God-given vision. Amen. You know, many women pray, the ones who are married, they pray for their husbands to, to move closer to God. And the ones who are not married are praying that they will marry a godly man. But the reason why you want a godly man is not so that he can be nice. <laughs> you can be nice without having God. Yeah. The reason why you want a godly man is not so that he can be self-disciplined. The reason why you want a godly man is you want a man that is so connected to God that he can hear from God. All right. Concerning your life, concerning the life of the family, he can receive a vision from God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Now, the interesting thing, like we said earlier, was that the woman is the help meet. And I love the word that PF has been using, if you were paying attention, the word partner. See, God gives a common purpose to the family. And the job of the woman, like we said, is to be the help meet. But how many of us will confess that it can be a struggle, either for the man to lead or for the woman to be the helpmate or the partner? Amen? See, Mark chapter 3, verse 25, I love this scripture. It says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Not may not. It is guaranteed that the house will not stand. Think about it this way. Imagine that you are, or, uh, you know, you're a football team. And I mean, American football, which is funny because they don't actually touch you with your feet. But imagine that you're a football team and you're working together and you have a team captain and then you have the rest of the team. Now, let me assume that as the woman, I like quarterback, so I'm the quarterback. You're and not the quarterback. The captain. <laughs> okay. I'm the quarterback. Is the quarterback the captain? There's no captain. I think I need to have, let me just use soccer because I don't watch football, I watch soccer. Okay, Better. so, <laughs> so you're, you're the captain and the woman is the goalkeeper, okay? Does that okay, work? yeah, that Amen. works. <laughs> and, and the great thing about the woman being the goalkeeper is that she's actually, again, protecting, you know, the goal, the, the goal post, protecting the home front from adversaries. Now, imagine if I have a misunderstanding or a tiff with the captain of my team. And then he is running the play and he's giving instructions and, there, and I decide that I am upset. So I'm just going to walk away from the goalpost. What am I doing? I'm leaving it open to the adversary. Who am I working against? You know, have you heard that phrase that some of us cut off our noses to spite our face? A lot of us, when we don't understand how this is supposed to work, when we're not working in line with the design that God had for marriage, we start to have problems. We're like those people that go to the doctor and say, you know, I'm not feeling good. And then the doctor writes your prescription after doing a diagnosis. And then you go to the pharmacy and you fill the prescription and you go home, put it away in your drawer and you do not take your pills. How many people here have been given antibiotics that you're supposed to take for a month? How many of us finished every single dose of that antibiotic after the month? Let, what, how many? Okay, not bad. Maybe about five people in here finished the antibiotic. Now, if that infection reoccurs, how many of us after we start to feel like that doctor doesn't know what he's doing? That's exactly the way a lot of us are functioning with marriage. Our marriages, are, a lot of them are challenged. A lot of them are struggling. Some are really not working. And we think it's because of the person that I married. If my wife could change, my husband could change. Because we do not understand how this thing is supposed to work. I said in Mark 3.25, if, if the house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. Do you want your marriage to stand? Do you want your relationship to stand? Do you want your family to stand? We have to start doing it God's way. Now, di division is actually division. It means we have two visions. So I have my own. I've got my plans. Intelligent went to school. Some of us here have PhDs, postgraduates, whatever, and he has his plan. So I'm working according to my plans and purposes. He's working according to his plans and purposes. Division or divergence of vision will surely lead to failure or at least a delay. 
Hallelujah. And so today what we're going to try to do is to paint a practical scripture and really dig deep into how this thing is supposed to work. Last week I said to you that the first thing you need to know about things that are important to you is you need to get is knowledge. At least you need to know the basics. And then you need to understand it. The next level is wisdom, which is practical application of the things that you not only know, but the things that you have understood. Amen? So we're going to talk a little bit about that famous scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, which I call church wars. Because if you want to start a war on social media, just quote anything in Ephesians chapter 5, starting from verse 22. Guaranteed. You're going to have tongue-speaking, Bible, you know, believing, saved, sanctified, baptized Christians will totally tear themselves apart once we get there. Amen. And I'm here for that war. <laughs> Amen. All right, it's on. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21. At the end of this, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for all the married people, all the single people, all the people who have never married, the people yeah. who are divorced, the people who are widowed. We're going to pray for everybody concerning relationship. Yeah? Um, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now that word submit in the Greek actually means to place or rank under to obey each other. Yeah, Amen. to obey each other. Amen. Now we often think of the head as a rank. Yeah? Hmm. So when you are the head, it means that, you know, you are superior you are ahead, you are first, mm. you are the boss, you are in charge. You are the most important. If the, you are the most important. If the head was superior or senior, the Bible would not say obey one another. Amen. Obedience flows down. But because God did not, so if obedience flows up, the people under obey the person on top. That's right. But God did not want it like that. So he brought Eve from the side of man, Hallelujah. not from under man. Amen. 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 And then Amen. he says in Ephesians, this famous Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 21, obey one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. Amen. The, the head is the head for a specific purpose, for a specific role. It is not superior to the arms. Hallelujah. And it is not superior to the legs. Amen. 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 He is the head to receive vision. We spend too much time interpreting scripture through the lens of our culture. Where I come from, the western part of Nigeria, the man is not only the head, he is the Lord and master. <laughs> Amen. Right. So when we read the Bible, we tend to read the Bible from the perspective of the head, meaning Lord and Master. Now, in the West, the husband is not Lord and Master. Amen? The husband, uh, it depends on the day. <laughs> Amen? But the Bible is, is universal. When you start to interpret it through the lens of culture, when the interpretation changes based on your geographical location, your interpretation is flawed. That's right. The Bible says we submit to one another. We obey one another. Hallelujah. And the only way that works is if we understand that this is a partnership. That's right. It's a partnership. I don't know anybody here. Have you ever been in a business partnership? Anybody? Anybody? You have a business partner. Okay. If you have a business partner, you know, yeah, that both partners, assuming they have 50-50 investment, both partners are equal. Everybody brings something to the table. Mm. They may have different areas of expertise or strength, and they work best together when they differ to each other in their area of expertise. That's right. Classic example. Let's say... Pastor Langre and I are in business together. We have equal investment in the business. But he's very uh, cerebral. You know, he's very intellectual. He's a strategist. He's a thinker. Now, I, on the other hand, am not as cerebral. But I have energy. I can do. When it comes to doing, I listen to him. 
When it comes to, so he listens to me. When it comes to strategizing, I listen to him. Amen. Everybody has authority in their area of strength. Amen. And that is how a partnership works. Hallelujah. The team members decide on the way forward. Amen. They obey each other. At a minimum, they deliberate over the decisions concerning the implementation of the vision that was given to the head. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. My wife and I, a long time ago, and I've said this to a lot of people that we were doing premarital counseling with. We were in uh, St. Louis, and we wanted to buy a house. Yeah? Now, my wife is usually the stingy one. Sorry, the, food, the prudent <laughs> one. And I am the, the generous one. Amen? <laughs> so we want to buy a house. And I, for some reason, I'm suddenly thinking about the budget. I never think about budget. And she, for some reason, has forgotten the budget. And all she's thinking about is how the house looks, right? So we, we find this house, and the house was beautiful. The house was just nice. My spec. It was our spec. But I looked at the numbers, and I said to her, Nee, these numbers do not work. <laughs> these numbers do not work. Eh, it's okay. We'll, these numbers do not work. And I refused to move forward because the numbers did not work. Now, you know what I do? I go and find the house. I think it looks okay. And the numbers work. She looks at the house and says, never. Can't cook in that kitchen. Man. Never. Mm -mm. So we don't move forward. We don't move forward. We go back to the drawing table and we start looking. Now, we were in a, in a rented house, a rented apart house. Yeah. And the landlord was putting us under pressure. Buy the house or move out. But rather than succumb to the pressure and take a decision that would make one person miserable, we prayed. And we went back and we started looking. Guess what? We found the house I that she loved yeah. and that worked with the numbers. Amen. That's how a team works. Amen. I can't say because I'm the head of the house. <laughs> and the Bible says, submit. Guess what? If I push it enough and she follows me to that house, every day that something happens in that house, I own it. So you. <laughs> so you. If she sees an aunt in the house, uh -huh. did I not warn you about this house? <laughs> If the power goes out, I told you about this house. And then guess what happens? I get frustrated, she gets frustrated, and next thing we're fighting. And by the time you unravel what we're fighting about, if you are able to unravel it, yeah. it started from, I bought a house based off of, I'm the head. Amen. I have my own. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Uh, I'm going to start moving a little quickly because of time says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. I love the way the, the Good News Bible says, it says, love one another warmly as Christians and be eager to show respect, respect, honor to one another. The reason why I wanted to make sure that I bring out that scripture is because in that Good News version, it says, love one another warmly as Christians. Have you noticed that a lot of us Christians are more Christian to outsiders than to our own spouse. Things you would never do, actions you would never take, expressions you would never use in public unless, you know, all the nuts are, you know, not quite like tightly screwed on. At work, behavior you would never exhibit to your pastors or to your leaders or to your co-workers. You feel very free to be yourself when you're at home and exhibit it to your spouse. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 24. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take a few moments to break it down what the woman's part of this whole thing is. Because I, I love the way the Bible is when you're not picking and choosing. So verse 21 says, submit ye to one another, love one another, obey one another. And then verse 22 says, wives, ooh, deep breath, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves. I'm reading from the uh, AMPC, the Amplified Classical Version. It says, wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own 
husbands as Not a to another service person's to husband, the Lord. To your own husband. <laughs> Emphasis, your own husband. And your husband only. <laughs> there are some of us women who will listen to our pastors, our fathers, our bosses, our co-workers, our respected prayer men of God first before our husbands. Our prophet. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then he says, for the husband, when the Bible says for, that means this is the reason why. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. As, that means in the same way that the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. The Living Bible says, well, you wives must submit to your husband's leadership. And Pierre already explained leadership. In the same way you submit to the Lord. Now, the reason why he says in the same way is because is it every single time that you completely and totally agree with what God is wanting you to do? Absolutely not. But you, what you trust, you love, and you respect God, so you do that. The, that word adapt, let's stay there for a second. That word adapt is actually a verb. It is an action, right? And it's from a root word adapter, which means to fit. Amen? To fit. That means that there are things that you may need to change. And the wonderful thing about the Bible is that when it says, it starts by saying, Lord, submit you to one another, obey one another. It's clear that I'm not saying that it's only the wife that is changing. And PF will get to the men's part in a minute. But let's just talk about the women now. So please listen and don't jump ahead. To, to adapt means to make something suitable to a new use or purpose. It means to modify it. I can tell you the honest truth. The person that I am now is different from the person that married PF. Very. Completely. Very. Amen. Very, very. And it's not a bad thing. It very means to modify, thing. to alter, to make alterations. You know, like when you buy a wedding dress and it's not, you know, made from, you buy, you love it, you fall in love with it, and then you go for fittings. And what do you do? You go for at least three or four fittings. You lose a little weight, you put on a little weight. They keep adjusting it until it is perfect for you. Do you complain when you have to keep going back to adjust your wedding dress? No, because you want at the end of the day, on that wedding day, to look a certain type of way. It means to transform, to redesign, to restyle, to refine to remodel, to reshape, to revamp, to tweak. That means that you make adjustments, not that you change the entire person. By the time a woman is completely lost and doesn't even recognize herself, there is a problem. You've gone a little bit too far. There is balance, but it means to adjust. When PF and I started our first, this is the third church that we have pastored and planted on our own. The very first one, very interesting church, um, it was in Vienna, in Europe. So I had to come straight off. I was about 24 or 25, something like that. So I had to come like straight off, fresh off the boat and start to adjust and work myself into this being a pastor's wife. Half the people in the church were twice my age. I had to learn that fine balance between respecting them and still being an inspiration, being able to teach and nurture them and still be able to influence them. Praise the name of the Lord. That meant that some things about me had to change. Amen. Spiritually, I had to step into a role that I was not necessarily already equipped for. I had to learn it. I had to pray it. I had to walk into it. I had to talk to God about it. I had to adjust certain things. Now, our second church was very different from this one. It was a lot more traditional. The people were not only a lot older, but their style of Christianity was a lot more traditional. They were more into hymns. They weren't doing, you know, like you fell on the, nah, 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 nothing like that. That wasn't their thing. So again, I had to make a few tweaks. So I was still myself, amen, but I dressed differently. I talked a little bit different. I walked a little bit differently. In our old church, you would not have recognized me because I had like, you know, the pastor's wife suit. You know those sketch suits? It's got to be like, right, exactly two inches below your knees, you know, always from, was it Tahiri or Tahiri? I can't even remember. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> people be saying, I don't know, we were every, every other Saturday we were there looking for a sketch suit that would fit. And then I, I wore the pastor's wife's hat, because I, that, I mean, if you, went, if you didn't have that hat on, nobody was listening to anything I had to say. And I didn't want to be a distraction. Praise the name of the Lord. Now in this church, I can come to, Pierre, can you imagine me in preaching St. Louis with, nah, it wouldn't work. 
And it's not about it. It is not. <laughs> it, is, it was my honor to be able to fit, to do things that fit. And I'm just giving you an example that I know you can identify with. Because of time, we're going to move on. But there's so many little different things. And it's not a bad thing. Change is not a bad thing. So long as we begin to fit together to work out that vision. Amen. Change is not a bad thing. That's it, right. It really isn't. I, I like this version better. <laughs> that uh, skirt suit wearing person. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big problem. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, and we're going to round up really quick. It says, and you husbands, show the kind of love to your wives as Christ showed to the church when he died for her hmm. to make her holy and clean, washed by baptism and God's word so that he could give her to himself. Hallelujah. So he, he died for her to give her to himself as a glorious church without a single spot or wrinkle or any other blemish, being holy and without a single fault. Christ died for the church to give the church to himself. Mm. The way you treat your wife, you are the one that will benefit from it. Amen. The way you lay your bed is how you will lie on it. That's right. Since that is how husbands should treat their wives, loving them as part of themselves. For since a man and his wife are now one, a man is really doing himself a favor and loving himself when he loves his wife. Amen. No one hates his own body but lovingly cares for it, just as Christ cares for his body, the church, of which we are parts. Hallelujah. You know, Christ died for the church. That is how he, he manifested, he demonstrated his love for us. And the Bible says Christ died for the church while we were still sinners. Man. So it wasn't after she submitted that he died. It mm. was his love that brought submission. Hallelujah. The Amen. church did not Amen. submit before Christ died. He died first. Mm. So who should go first? The leader goes first. All right. So if you are the leader, if you are the head, you love first. Amen. And you don't love how you like. You love the way Christ loved. Amen. And the Bible is clear on the way Christ loved. First Corinthians, uh, is it 13 or 11? Yeah. 13, love is kind. 13. Love is patient. patient. Love is generous. Amen. That is how you love, in the way that Christ loved. Christ gave up his life. He gave up his life Hallelujah. for his church. Hallelujah. How many of us will give up anything significant for mm. our wives. Mm. We expect our wives to adapt. Mm. We expect our wives to change. Mm. But we live our lives the way we want. Mm. And because she is my wife, therefore, it is all about me. What I want, how I want it. That is not what Christ did for us. In fact, you know what? He died for us and in Christ... Guess what? In Christ, we find fulfillment. Hallelujah. We find the answer to our prayers. Hallelujah. We find the ability to achieve our vision. Hallelujah. The way that you, you deal with your spouse, and, and let me also say, just say this really quick. My time is definitely up, and I'm going to say this really quick so that we can just go straight to prayer. When you're looking for a spouse, Ladies, and I'm talking to the ladies particularly. Look for a man who can lay down his life for you. Amen. Look for Amen. a man who, for Amen. the sake of Christ, Amen. and Adam, be careful. This laying down his life for you hmm. is not for you to do whatever you like. All right. So you want to buy a pair of Louboutin shoes. Amen. Hmm. There's only $50 in the account. So he should lay down his life for you. That is error. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It is that he loves you. He's willing to put aside his emotions. He's willing to put aside his frustrations. He's willing to put you first, put your happiness, put your joy, put your faith. He's willing to make sacrifices Amen. for you. Amen. Amen? Amen. Marriage is, uh, is tough. But the toughness of it 
is in the ability of all of us, male and female, to put our emotions on the back foot Amen. and our faith on the front foot. Amen. That is the challenge. Now, I, I, I'm standing here. Don't, please don't misunderstand. I'm not standing here as, as perfect. I've made some terrible mistakes in my marriage. But the only reason why this marriage still stands is because my wife has taken her role as protector, as defender, as helper. On it to, I mean, she, 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 she has embraced it. And I have embraced my own role as leader, as visionary, as one who lays down his life mm. for her. Amen. So that even when there are mistakes, even when there are challenges, mm. even when there are struggles, we have a vision. We have a common purpose that unites us beyond just the satisfaction of our emotions. Amen. Amen. We'll pray Amen. at this point because our time is up and Amen. I don't want to keep everybody Amen. here. I just want to say before we go into prayer that if we can only purpose today to begin to conduct our relationships and our marriages by God's formula. God's formula is perfect and it is complete. Imbalance is what is killing and destroying us. When you hear people yelling, submit, 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 you know that this one is just starting. If you hear somebody yelling, you must love me, you must love me, you must love me, you know that this one doesn't have a clue. But if we step into a place where in partnership, we are both doing it according to God's prescription, it becomes heaven on earth. Challenging, yes, but it becomes an adventure and it becomes beautiful and it becomes complete because God's formula is flawless. Just Amen. as my wife is flawless. <laughs> Amen. Okay, you know, you have to drop. You understand? Just, uh, just drop some, you know, so that uh, the jollof rice will be nice. Amen. Can we just guys to our feet and pray? This evening we're... Yes. And the folks who are watching the service online, you know, I just want to pray for everybody here. And our, our, the, the, the focus of our prayer here is hope. Amen. Hope that where you are, if it is not where you want to be, in Christ, you can get to your destination. Amen. If your relationship status is not what you want it to be, in Christ, it can change. Amen. If everything is good, it can be great. Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. Amen. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Almighty God, we give you praise. My Father, my God, we thank you for your children, the ones who are single in, at this point, the ones who are divorced, the ones who are widowed, the ones who are married, the marriages that are struggling, the marriages that appear to be dead, and the marriages that are doing well. Father, we pray for everybody. We ask that in every situation, you Amen. will open the eyes of our understanding. Amen. You open the eyes of our heart that Amen. we may see, Father, your word Amen. and see the light that we have in your word yes, to get us, almighty God, to the Amen. destination that you have ordained for Amen. us. Father, for your sons, I ask that you will grant them vision. I ask that you will grant them a sense of purpose. Father, open their eyes and their hearts to see beyond their personal comfort, to find themselves and their place in you. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, I pray for your daughters. I pray, Almighty God, that you will grant them also a sense of purpose, yes, a sense of destiny, yes, a sense, Father, of the love that you have for them. Fill our hearts, Almighty God, with reverence for you. Amen. That even in our relationships, your name may be glorified. Amen. My Father, my God, I know that it is your will for all of us to walk a walk that will please you. Amen. Father, I ask that you help us. Yes, Lord. Give us the strength. Amen. Give us the wisdom. Amen. Give us the knowledge. Amen. And give us the understanding. Amen. Let your spirit prevail in yes, our hearts. Lord. Yes, Lord. 
when all the other voices are raving and ranting, when our flesh and our emotions are loud, mm. let the voice of your spirit be clear. Yes, Lord. Piercing through the darkness. Thank you, Father. Amen. We bless you and we give you praise. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.